welcome back to Stuff My Therapist Says. We're so excited to have you back, Doug Puchko. Yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate uh, being welcome back, and I'm excited to get into it. Yeah, of course. You, I was actually just chatting with Autumn, and I was telling her how you are such a wealth of wisdom, and how smart you are, and how amazing of a counselor you are, and I'm just so excited to get to learn more from you, because every time you and I chat... I learned so much from you, so I know our audience is going to love this. Awesome. I appreciate that. I, a lot of it is from the books I read, but I'll, I'll take the credit where, yeah. where it comes. Well, you get the credit for sure. <laughs> so what can you tell me about the history of online therapy prior to the pandemic? Sure. So a lot of people think that I think telehealth really got big whenever the pandemic hit for, for obvious reasons, but there's a lot of different versions or variations of it that existed way back into the 80s. Um, some people kind of think it started in 1986 uh, in terms of like online formulas where we'd be kind of emailing somebody like, hey, I'm going through this, rough forms of email, right? It, mm-hmm. In the 80s, uh, 90s became a little bit more substantial when you kind of had somebody who's trying to go into practice of it. And then luckily, once Congress passed the HIPAA uh, compliance in the 96 uh what they came to focus on is like the importance of making sure these emails are secure mm-hmm. and the importance of that our information is okay. And like, we can actually do this and keep track of things and make sure that the client's priorities of what they're coming up with and kind of being vulnerable about is being regulated and, and watched over. Yeah. Uh, so once that happened, it, it kind of built up a lot of good energy and focus on let's make sure clients feel safe. Let's make sure that we can do this and we can also have good correspondence with them. Mm-hmm. So HIPAA is so important. I actually have a funny little story. So my dad brought me to bring your kid to work day and he was, he still actually works at UPMC and we were learning about HIPAA. And I remember like learning about HIPAA when I was in um, elementary school and thinking, huh, when am I ever going to need to use that information? (laughs) And yeah, it's very relevant clearly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Yeah. Provides a lot of, I think it provides a lot of protection and, and just, weight off people's shoulders of like, oh, I can talk about this here. And provides that safety of, it doesn't leave this room. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Versus before, like, I mean, providers could essentially share what was happening with their patients and there was not that confidentiality that there is now. So HIPAA is a wonderful thing for protecting Uh, your privacy. Share or sell, right? They could sell it to whoever was interested in kind of like who to market towards or, or whatever um, nefarious might have happened prior yeah. to it. Uh, but fast forwarding to out of the 90s into the 2012 era is whenever you first start to have major companies uh, really embrace and use HIPAA compliance to work with clients in video conferencing, which is mm-hmm. kind of like more what we know today, yeah. not quite where it hit during COVID because I think there's a lot of ramp up in technology of like, well, this needs to be provided and we can't do it in person. But it's kind of video conferencing really took off around 2010 era uh, mm-hmm. going forward. Once COVID hit and the pandemic happened, a lot of people wanted to do therapy or wanted to continue what they were doing, but kind of had that difficulty with it because we weren't allowed to leave the room, right? You had to kind of stay quarantined. You kind of had to stay within your pod. And so finding that balance of who's getting involved with therapy. So what all do you think contributed to the rise of telehealth since COVID? Sure. So I think what really came to the rise of it is kind of the quarantining concept that we ought to stay within our pods and we kind of had to stay within people we knew and nobody wanted to go out involved with people they didn't know and especially if going into a therapist's office you need the six feet apart right you yeah. need the space having somebody cycle into that constantly of like new person new person there's a lot of one airflow of not really kind of spreading it and concern for that so a mm-hmm. lot of people decided to make the jump to well what if i could do this virtually yeah and i think you saw a lot of companies rise out of that a lot of studies have shown that there's like a, a 10% increase in demand for treatment with anxiety, especially mm-hmm. dealing with people of all generations. I think a lot of people think like, oh, online therapy is a young person game. But a lot of studies have shown that a lot of older people, 18 to 29 was about 66% of it. Mm-hmm. But you can't discredit the 36% of those, 36% of those were 65 or older. Yeah. Right. And so with that is a lot of people who consider out of touch or like, well, maybe I shouldn't do therapy were really seeking it out because they needed that space, you know, yeah. especially I think COVID hit a lot of COVID hit a lot of older generation, especially hard when it came to wanting to make sure that they were secure, they were more at risk. Mm-hmm. And so I think a lot of them had a lot more anxiety ramp up to begin with. Yeah. Uh, a lot of federal studies were even done kind of showing 
not just telehealth when it came to therapy, but telemedicine, right? A lot of people went to doctor's visits online. Yeah. And so I think it brought it a lot more into the socially acceptable realm of we can see our medical professionals mm -hmm. just as much as you can have a doctor's visit within reason, do a quick checkup. Oh, I can do the same with a therapist. And there's mm -hmm. validation there because I've done it with my PCP. Yeah. It kind of helps build to that. This is okay. Or like, this isn't just for people who might really need it. Like, I, I can use this. I can benefit from this. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And they've tested it out with their PCPs or other providers beforehand and know that it is a secure method of meeting with someone. Absolutely. And I think when it comes to, you know, we can talk about vulnerability and resilience theory as well, right? Which yeah. is kind of the more stress you have in your life, the more parts of, of like what makes up you are shaky, right? If work's a little shaky because I have to, I can't go into the office anymore. I don't have that social connection anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't see extended family anymore. Yeah. The more those that start to feel shaky or start to feel like they aren't secure or, or concrete, stress goes up, vulnerability goes up mm -hmm. and, and susceptibility to what might not have stressed me out as much in the past of kind of my partner who leaves a drink out on the table or something like that yeah. might really hit because instead of it feeling like this is a small thing, it's like I see this every day because we're in the same space, right? You kind of have that build up and I think it increases a lot of people's tension, stress, anger, sadness, whatever it might be yeah. when you're in that more vulnerable state. Yeah. Yeah. And this was happening on a mass scale and then projection can happen too where, you know, one thing, it's one thing that's stressing you out, but then you end up taking it out on the wrong person. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And that paired with technology focus, mm -hmm. like I kind of mentioned earlier when it came to, I think everybody was aware of, of Skype and kind of yeah. that used to be the big thing a decade or so ago and nothing against them, but Zoom really came out of, of nowhere. Yeah. And because they could offer a lot of people in the same time, companies really took off with them. And so people were more familiar with that, just needing that to kind of have access to do work mm -hmm. as well as it became really easy to get HIPAA compliant Zoom. Yeah. Right? And which brings HIPAA back into it. And so people are like, oh, this is a great feature. I can use this. And there's yeah. a lot of other different organizations and different companies that came into the light. But I think a lot of people became so much more familiar with what teleconferencing was in all aspects, even to talk to friends, FaceTime, whatever it was that like this didn't feel as distant anymore because it became such the norm Mm -hmm. This is how we communicate with people. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. So what all have you noticed to be some of the reasons clients seem to prefer online therapy compared to in-person therapy? Sure. I think a, a huge one that I've kind of come across is people having privacy in their own home. Mm -hmm. Right. Whenever it came to the social stigma that might exist of like, well, I have to go see my therapist or I have to go travel across town and like be seen walking into the office. Some people saw that as like a little bit of a deterrent. You know, mm -hmm. not a major one, but enough to like... I don't know if I want to be seen as someone going there, but if it's, well, I can call from my bedroom or I can call yeah. from a place of comfort and security and safety, maybe I can access this. Yeah. Right? And it kind of bridges a lot of those gaps that some might have been impeding some people in engaging in the first place. Mm -hmm. I think that along with travel, yeah. right? Instead of having to say, well, I get off work at six and then if I get over to my therapist's office, it'll be like 6.30 with traffic, maybe seven, and then I have to get home. It just makes it near impossible if you have that plus kids. Yeah. Right. And they're like, well, I need to get home to make sure they have food. And then so I don't really have time to take care of myself. Yeah. The hierarchy of needs. Absolutely. Right. And so being able to say, well, I can do this on my lunch break or I can do this before I start my day or I can mm -hmm. do this right when I get home or like once the kids are asleep and I can kind of just have this time to myself to process what I've been going through. And then, like you said, prioritize myself now mm -hmm. once those needs are met. I think it access, open access to a lot of people. So it becomes a lot more convenient when you can see your provider online. What are some of the other reasons why people prefer seeing their provider online? Yeah, it's, it's less intimidating. Yeah. Um, they don't have to worry about the stigma that carries with it. They can keep it to themselves. You don't have to tell your like partner or, or your friends of like, well, I have to go travel to my therapist. It can just kind of be like, oh, like this hour. I mean, and I've had a lot of clients where you're like, I'm with my doctor, right? Mm -hmm. Like kids exist still. So I've had, you know, sometimes that their child will interrupt the, the session and they'll just be like, hey, I'm seeing I'm my specialist or I'm seeing a medical health professional. And they don't have to reveal like a therapist because yeah. they're, they're, even though they find benefit, there can still be some stigma of like, well, I don't want to have to feel like I fully need to say that. And you're still telling the truth or you're still kind yeah. of giving yourself that space. Yeah. I need this time for mental health or I need this time for, for my, my health. Yeah. And a lot of offices will say, okay, you can have that hour each week for your health visit and they're not going to ask any further questions. Right. And mm -hmm. it's kind of giving that freedom to allow it. Yeah. Uh, aside from that, it's also cheaper sometimes with copays. Oh yeah. So you have the benefit of not having to be a financial expense of, of parking and driving, but also not having to be as high as a financial expense of just being there and being able to kind of pay a lower copay, make the barrier entry 
a little bit more easier for a lot of people to access, mm -hmm. especially as, as finance can be difficult around this time. A lot yeah. of inflation and everything else going on. Yeah, it's been rough. I mean, I saw a meme online today and was talking about $13 for eggs, for a, for a dozen of eggs. I mean, that's not that I grocery shop to know how much eggs cost, but that's a lot. Yeah, I mean, like I, I remember them being like $3 and I don't know if that's true or not, or if this is like false news, but inflation definitely has been on the rise for sure. And so if you're able to save on your co-pays, it's a big deal. And I have seen that. I mean, every payer or every insurance company is different and every company has its different contracts with insurance companies. But I have noticed with some of our payers for telehealth, it can be less. Sometimes it's the same as in-person sure. therapy, but sometimes it's, it's less. And when it is less, it's typically significantly less. Like yeah. sometimes it's like only $5 or 10 bucks compared to 50 or more than that. So absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And even with it being less, you also have the benefit of sometimes it can just be over the phone. Yeah. Right. And so if you're not in a place where you can have that, that video privacy, you're like, Hey, let me just go out to my car and yeah. I, I feel comfortable enough to just do it over the phone. That option can be available. Yeah. And I've had a lot of clients who are able to use that whenever they don't have full privacy visually mm -hmm. or, or they're just, I kind of feel more comfortable of, well, I don't really want to have to expose myself. Let's say you're going through something where you feel discomfort when it comes to your self image. Yeah. I can just go through the phone for now. Yeah. Right? We can kind of process what you're going through without having to face the image of yourself in telehealth, right? And kind yeah. of seeing yourself like you would in a FaceTime or something like that. Yeah. So it provides even more flexibility for people who are, are not quite as tentative to engage in the full video conferencing, but I can at least have the engagement of just being able to talk to somebody for support. So what if any limitations have you noticed with online therapy? Sure. So I, I think that's a fair question because I think there are a lot of benefits that come with it, but there's also, it's not a cure-all, right? Like you, mm -hmm. like any other kind of medicine or any kind of fix, it's very dependent on the person. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to online therapy, some of the things you need to look out for are just simple technological things, right? Like yeah. Wi-Fi dropping out or power going out or electricity cutting out or something like that where the call gets disrupted or a lag or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. And so typically the solution for those is like, okay, I'll give you a call if the call drops. And mm -hmm. there's kind of that security and like, at least I can reach out to you this way so we can still continue the session, not lose where we were, yeah. but still have this plan in place if needed. Yeah. A lot of flexibility as well and kind of being able to see what works for you or, or what times change because life can be busy. Mm -hmm. And so if you're scheduling in person, it might be a lot harder to make that change, but you have that benefit of, well, I can just move this uh, over a half hour. Is that okay? Cause I'm in traffic. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sure. We can kind of, if that fits the schedule, it can make it happen. Another thing that's a, a major concern about telehealth is kind of the heightened care that's needed. Mm -hmm. right? Somebody has suicidal ideation or somebody who, who's actively homicidal ideation or even going through very severe life threatening conditions, whether it's eating disorders or, or whether that's, having high hallucinations or, or questioning reality, those are people who might benefit a lot more from being in person, mm -hmm. right? They need that kind of in-person reality check or they need that in-person verification of like, how is your health doing? Yeah. How are you doing? Let's kind of process that together versus just being able to maintain anxiety, depression, things that kind of be treated without having to be fully in check. Yeah, yeah. And that goes back to the level of care that the patient is at and should really be at because not every time when a patient reaches out are they truly appropriate for a telehealth outpatient level of care sometimes they would do better at an inpatient level of care sometimes they really need to be hospitalized or you know go through a detox through a rehab so it all really depends on where the client is at and, you know, assuming that they don't have a condition or they don't, they don't have a diagnosis that really requires in-person treatment or a higher level of care. At Macon Wellness, our priority is helping you heal and become happy again. We make it easy for you to connect with our exceptional team of therapists right from the comfort and privacy of your device. Not only is this approach more accessible, but it also comes at a much lower cost compared to traditional in-person counseling. We believe no one deserves to suffer in silence and encourage you to work through your challenges so you can live life to the fullest. Call 833-274-HEAL or visit makeandwellness.com to get started with online therapy. One of the barriers too that I was just thinking of as you're talking, Doug, is when is state licensing. Sure. That is a huge barrier if someone moves which it seems like the past few years really ever since COVID a lot of people have been moving like 
more than usual, I would say. And so if someone moves outside of the state, the provider isn't already duly licensed or if they can't quickly obtain a dual licensure in the state that that client is moving to, then they would need to be transferred to someone else, which can be a huge pain for the client because it's not the easiest thing in the world to find a great therapist that you connect with. And then having to start over again can be really hard too. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. I, I think a lot of that's because of work becoming, you can tell a commute to work, right? Yeah. And I can just do this so I can work from anywhere. So yeah. why would I keep working here if I can? And I think when that travel happens, it's frustrating because that disconnection, right? Because if mm-hmm. we were seeing in person, like you leave the city, I, I can't see you anymore. But yeah. if they, if they move across the state, we're still within the state boundaries so we can keep meeting. Yeah. It, it's difficult. I mean, even starting like any kind of relationship, whether mm-hmm. with a therapist or friend or whatever it might be, is hard to restart with someone else. Yeah. Because then you have to re- learn everything and re kind of go over how that person functions. And so there, there can be that, that disruption. Uh, but I think it's imperative to find again, that what fits best for the client. Exactly. And yeah. I, even when it comes to seeking higher care, right. Or seeking more escalated care of inpatient, mm-hmm. like you said, addictions or whatever it might be. I always compare it to if I'm, I'm seeing a client who kind of gets to that state because mm-hmm. of life events around them that have kind of deteriorated their, their resiliency and they're highly vulnerable right now. I always compare it to, you know, if I, if I get burned on something and I try to go to an urgent care, you know, or a, a quick kind of care company, they're not going to say like, yeah, we can treat you here. They say like, no, you need to go to the ER Yeah. because we can help, but they're designed for those things. Exactly. And it's, you can come back to us, you know, once you've healed and you have a different concept or you're kind of in recovery, like we can help manage that. Yeah. But those are escalated for a reason because yeah. they have the tools, the in-person kind of stuff that you need, whether it's 24 hour watch or whether it's just instant surveillance and assistance, Mm -hmm. they provide those things. Yeah, yeah. And at times that can be what's needed. I liked what you mentioned about the state situation too. Um, Have you ever heard of Teladoc by any chance? I have not. So Teladoc, if I remember correctly, was the world's first telemedicine company. And one of their co-founders is Michael Gordon. And I was lucky enough to get to meet him. And him and I were talking and he has an amazing book that he came out with. I think it was with his lawyer and one other person. But anyways, he was talking about how when they were expanding Teladoc, which now it's like a multi-billion dollar company, it's a huge telemedicine company, how every time they would expand to a new state, many times they'd get sued by the state because a lot of states in in the U.S. didn't want telemedicine to essentially be a thing at that point in time. This was in the 80s or the 90s. Um, I don't remember what the time frame of it was. Um, and he was saying they spent so much in attorney's fees and like, you know, they were looking for different like loopholes and different ways to be able to practice remotely. And it's just amazing to see like how him and his team, like with everything that they've done to help to get states to accept telehealth, like that really helps us out now and helps patients out now because someone needed to fight that fight. And that was a very expensive fight. So yeah, all the trailblazers always kind of do all the the heavy lifting and work, but the good things have come out of it. Oh, for sure. And so it's it's still a kind of continuous progress of trying to focus on the client's health versus kind of like state roles ideas, because we all base it off, you know, uh, American psychology culture is what our, our system's based on. So having state boundaries can really, get in the way of what should be client care instead exactly. of focusing on like what the state itself is gaining or losing from the profession or dues or whatever you want to call it. Exactly. Exactly. It's fascinating stuff. So what are some things people might want to be aware of when they are choosing online therapy? It seems like nowadays, and I don't know if it's because of my role within make and wellness or what, but it's like, there's always new online therapy companies popping up and there's so many places someone can go to, like what should a client really consider when choosing? Because there's lots of options out there. Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I, I get clients sometimes where it's their first time ever in therapy yeah. and they kind of finally made that, that leap and they're kind of reaching out. And I, I like to ask them like, what, what are your perceptions of it? Like, what do you feel like is positive or negative or you feel like this is not going to work or do you, are you open to it? And just kind of gauge where they're at. Because I think it's really important, one, to make sure that you have the time and space for it. Um, it can't be done uh, like while you're shopping and just kind of like have a Bluetooth headset in. Definitely not. <laughs> right. Because you're not going to be able to open up to being as vulnerable as you need. You're not going to be able to exactly. engage in kind of the full concentration of like focusing on you, which is yeah. kind of why we're here. 
Yeah. Right. Not just to kind of go through some questions and back and forth, but like really engage like what makes up you in the process. Mm -hmm. So privacy is central, having an hour carved out, right? Just to make sure that there isn't a quick time restraint of like, well, like I need to do this because then your mind's going to be preoccupied on, I have to run after this, right? Yeah. And I, I need to get out of here. That on top of, you know, feel free to ask questions. But I always say like, this space is yours. I'm here to kind of help you through it. So if you have questions about like what to expect or what should I be doing or what should I be thinking, ask them. Yeah. Right? Typically the, the answer will be like what you think is right. Yeah. But finding out this is your space, right? It isn't, yeah. you're not going to say something that's going to be like, well, you can't ask that here. Right. Yeah. But kind of going through and navigating what makes you feel comfortable there, what you think you want to know. Uh, some people kind of have ideas in mind of like, I heard CBT is really good or I heard that, you know, ACT would be really beneficial for me or like yeah. maybe a psychoanalytic theory. And feel free to ask those questions, right? Mm -hmm. The therapist can either say like, that's not my specialty or I know somebody whose specialty it is or like, mm -hmm. what what do you feel like you need about those things? What have you heard? Yeah. But it can be that space to just kind of understand that connection that you can form with the therapist as well as the style that they have, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't always have to be, we have one style and that's what we go with, yeah. but we kind of adapt to the client and what we're capable of doing. And sometimes that's going to be keeping that connection or it can be like, well, I can refer you to somebody that might better fit. Like maybe it's trauma specialist and yeah. I only do, you know, anxiety and depression, right? Yeah. Or maybe it's grief and that's not my forte. So yeah. finding that balance of what exactly you are looking for and speaking up if you feel, you know, promoting your own self-advocacy of like, I feel like this isn't working or I don't like when these words are spoken or when we talk about the subject. Because yeah. that's really important to understand not just what you're going through, but like what's happening within the room. Yeah. Because that can be changed if they don't realize that these words are upsetting to hear. Okay. You know, I can change that to make sure that that's not what we're addressing at this moment. Yeah. And that's amazing too, because it's practicing advocating for yourself in doing so in a safe space. And you can take that skill set and take that experience and take it into your personal life or into your work life, which is amazing. And many times when a client can feel like maybe it's not the greatest fit or exactly what you said, if like the clinician says something that they de necessarily don't agree with, don't consider just dropping out of therapy and just giving up. You can reach out to a manager and they can absolutely support you and, you know, get you transferred to someone else who would be a better fit or they could have the conversation with the provider in advance. So there's lots of options and it takes time to find the right therapist too. And I think at Make and Wellness, we do a really exceptional job at reducing that curve for people and getting clients connected with the right providers. And not every provider can see every type of client. There have been times where, like, let's say, based off of this podcast, a client finds you, Doug, and they want to meet with you, but you're not specialized in the specific thing that they could really benefit from. But Gabby is specialized in that or Randy or Emma or someone else. And so it's also important to keep in mind as a client that sometimes it, it's so much better to see a, a specialist that can help with whatever you're specifically struggling with. And that makes a big difference too. I actually had a client recently that I transferred to Gabby because she does amazing work with eating disorders and body image and you know, I was working with this client for years, Doug. It was like about four years. And this is what the core issue ended up becoming. Or it, it's like therapy is almost like an onion where you're like peeling off yeah, layers. Absolutely. And after four years of peeling off layers, body image was the concern. And I was very transparent like, this is not my specialty. I really can't support you with this. And I know someone who can. And so we ended up transferring him and it's, been going well and he has the support that he needs and so understanding too whenever you do start therapy it's sometimes you're with that therapist for years and sometimes it's a shorter time frame and that's okay and it's just part of the process and that's whether you're in online therapy with us at make and wellness or if you're seeing an in-person therapist absolutely and I, I really like the way you phrase that because I I have a clients as well where I'm kind of like, oh, like we can work on this. You know, we got A, B, C, D, and then you get to E and you're like, that's not my specialty. Yeah. Right. And that's, that's okay. Cause just like you're going to a doctor's office and they're exactly. like, I'm not a cardio, you know, that's not my, <laughs> my bag. Like I don't yeah. do that. So like I can refer you. And I like that we have enough people at Macon where we can make those referrals of, Hey, like I know this person does really well when it comes to neurodivergency. So like, yeah. let me kind of pass you to them because they'll be able to focus on this specific issue 
a little bit better than I can. Yeah. Right. And it's not because anything that you've done in this relationship exactly. that I need to get you out of here, but just they'll definitely get you the best care. And that's what's important. Yeah. That's what matters at the end of the day. Excellent client care and taking amazing care of our clients. So Doug, do you have any final words of wisdom to share with our audience? I think when it comes to final words of wisdom, especially when we're on telehealth, I think what's really important is just kind of being open to it, making sure you give yourself that, that time space, uh, and treating it as you would a doctor's office, right? You mm -hmm. kind of go there for that visit so that you can be seen and focused on and have you as the center of attention, mm -hmm. right? I'm here for my health. The same thing when it comes to therapy, right? Yeah. I, I'm giving myself this time space to have this telehealth in this instance, but so that I can focus on me. So make sure you give yourself that credit you deserve and, and give yourself that space to just feel comfortable, open, they're only going to know as much as you tell them, right? Yeah, exactly. So just allow yourself to be vulnerable because that's what we're here for. That's what it's designed for. Exactly. And honesty and vulnerability will help you out so much in the long run because your therapist, unfortunately, can't read your mind and only has insight into your life, into your situation. Like the amount of insight that they have really depends on how much you share with them. And so we're not here to judge you or any or shame you or anything like that the more honest you are the better and so that way your therapist can better support you absolutely yeah wonderful stuff well thanks so much for being on doug this is so insightful as always yeah thank you so much for having me back yeah of course